Oh, uh, waiter. Yes, sir? I'll have a slice of baked ham, a potato salad, and a cold bottle of Pabst Blue Ribbon. Yes, sir. Finest beer, sir. Anywhere. From Hollywood, Pabst Blue Ribbon. Finest beer served anywhere. Proudly presents... Screen Directors Playhouse, production, appointment for love, director William Siter, star Charles Boyer. The Hollywood Screen Directors present an excursion into comedy. The motion picture story, Appointment for Love. Starring Charles Boyer with Gail Storm and introduced by the director of the film, William Seiker. For something like 35 years, People have been laughing at the efforts of our guest screen director tonight. And their laughter has been a compliment, for most of his 175 films have been comedies, among them Roberta, The Affairs of Susan, and One Touch of Venus. Ladies and gentlemen, the director of tonight's story, Appointment for Love, Mr. William Seiter. Thank you. Recalling those 175 films leaves me a little weak in the knees. I don't know how that many pictures ever happened to me. But somehow they did, and one of those that amused me most is tonight's story. And now we hope that Appointment for Love will be your appointment for laughter as Charles Boyer recreates his original role of Andrew Cassiel, a successful playwright, with Gail Storm as Dr. Jane Alexander. <laughs> Critics say it's the best Andre Cassil play. And plays parties are the best things about his opening nights. He serves the most darling hors d'oeuvres. Well, Andre, I've been producing your plays for five years. And this looks like the biggest yet. Oh, thank you, George. Uh, tell me, uh, did I invite that girl to my party? Which girl? The one standing near the door. Oh, her? But I think she's a friend of somebody's friend. Uh, they say she's a doctor. A doctor? She couldn't be a doctor. She's too attractive. Andre! Happy darling! Oh, hello, Nancy. I'm so glad you could come. I'll bet you are. I've been out of town for three months and you don't even know it. Oh, yes, I, I've missed you, darling. Terribly. Well, don't take it so hard, Pat. The best actress in New York is back and raring for work. Tonight's play was sensational. What about the next one? Well, we'd love to have you, Nan. Uh, why don't you talk to George about it? But, Andre! See you later, darling. I must speak to somebody. Hello. Oh, Hello. Are you enjoying the party? Oh, it's very nice, but I don't seem to know many people. Well, uh, mostly from the theater. I'm mostly out of it. I know. You are a doctor. Doctor what? Dr. Alexander. Jane Alexander. Oh. Uh, tell me, tell me, doctor, uh, just between us, uh, do you have any uh, clinical opinions about um, Andre Cassil's new play? Really? Really. Terrible. Oh. No good, eh? No good. I saw it. Mm, I agree. I wrote it. I know. Oh, <laughs> then I didn't fool you. <laughs> not at all. Who could mistake the charming Mr. Cassiel? Eh, charm, but not a very good playwright. Now, now, you agree that my situations are phony, contrived, and unbelievable? I agree. Absolutely. Now, now you're not uh, just agreeing to be polite. Oh, not at all. The people in your play are unreasonable, illogical, Now, now, wait. And... They were in love. And love is an unreasonable, illogical emotion. I'm sorry, Mr. Cassiel. Andre. Andre, but love is very logical. Scientific. Put two objects with affinity in a test tube and they merge through attraction. Mm. It's the simplest of all formulas. Mm, that's very scientific, I'm sure, but... Well, all you do is add a little rose-colored romance and cloud up what's really happening. Mm. You know, you are the only person who knows the truth about my plays. Except myself, of course. Andre, you're the worst kind of faker. 
You like your plays. <laughs> You're right again. I adore them. Well, now they will always remind me of you. And what will I remind you of? Well, I imagine a test tube full of rose-colored romance. <laughs> Good night, Mr. Castillo. No, no, wait, wait, please, Jane. Good night. Andre, do you really want to cast Nancy in your next play? Eh? Oh, if you want her, George. You know, I think I just fell in love. With the doctor? That was no doctor, Georgie. That was a woman. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Alexander. Well, what are you doing in the hospital? Well, I came to see you do it. Do what? Make love with a test tube. You know, <laughs> you, you said you put in two people uh, and, Mr. Uh, Casillo. Andre. Andre, I'm sorry, but I'm not allowed to have social calls in my private office. Oh, but this is not a social call, Jane. You know, you are actually undermining my health. I didn't sleep a wing last night thinking about what you told me. You'll have to leave. Then have dinner with me tonight. Well, I'm sorry, Tomorrow but night, I... Tomorrow night, then. No. Very well. As my doctor, you should know, I'm in very great pain. Where? Here. My heart. It hurts. What was that? The sound of a test tube calling to its mate. <laughs> now, will you have dinner with me? I will not. I'm in agony. Uh, oh! Mr. Cassiel, this is a hospital. Well, then your business is to cure the suffering. I am suffering. No. All right. Oh! <laughs> Dr. Alexander, what's going on in here? Oh, why, uh, nothing, Dr. Gunther. And Dr. Gunther, I'm in agony, great agony. You look healthy enough. Well, I'll show you. Oh! All right, shut up. Dr. Alexander, <laughs> this man is a patient. Yes, we'll, uh, we'll administer the proper treatment. Now, the treatment I suggested? Yes. Thank you, Doctor. And, uh, Doctor. Yes? Uh, bring two test tubes. We may need a spare. <laughs> Will that be all, Mr. Castillo? Yes, thank you, waiter. You know, my dear doctor, I'm still uncaptivated by your theory. I wonder if you really believe it yourself. Well, let's take your theory, Andre. The writer's view of love. Emotional, hectic, and full of fizz. Well, we've dined together five or six times, but still no fizz. Oh, it's too soon. Besides, the setting is not right. I'd like you to see the terrace of my apartment. Sound of the traffic, million miles away. The lights twinkling like, like a vast necklace encircling the city. And in the moonlight, oh, it's so, so romantic. Well, so, hello, Pappy. Oh, hello, Nancy. Yeah, hi, Andre. Hello, George. Uh, Jane, these are my friends, uh, Nancy Benson and George Hastings, my producer. Uh, Dr. Alexander. Hello. Well, how do you do, Doctor? Andre was just telling me about his terrace. Oh, the terrace. The sound of the traffic a million miles away. The lights twinkling like... Uh, Nancy, dear, why don't you shut your lovely trap? But, George... Dr. Alexander, excuse me. There's a call for you from the hospital. I'll take the call here, waiter. Hello? This is Dr. Alexander. No, don't do that. I'll be there in ten minutes. Get everything ready. Goodbye. Well... Duty seems to call the doctor. I'm sorry, it's an emergency, Andre. I'll go with you. No, it'll probably take hours and hours. Good night, everyone. Oh, oh good, good night, night. Doctor. Good night, uh, Patty. Hello. You shouldn't have waited out here all night. I wanted to. I'm so glad you did. I was afraid you'd be tired. I am, but I feel wonderful. Let's sit here on the steps a minute. Of course, darling. They said she'd die, but she didn't. I've never seen you this way before. I never felt this way. Dr. Gunther was there. He said I willed her alive. I couldn't tell him how I felt. I couldn't tell anybody but you. And you were right here. I'll always be here, Jane. Andre, about that theory of mine. Yes? Just before I left, I broke a test tube. It was empty, Andre. Mm -hmm. You know, Jane, I've invented so many characters, little puppets for my plays, and so many times my little men have proposed to my little women. They've been very clever. But I don't feel clever now. I just want you to marry me. 
And I now pronounce you man and wife. Andre. My darling. Oh, Andre, it's four o'clock. So? I'm late for an appendectomy. Uh, what? I'm due at the hospital in ten minutes. I'll call you later. Aren't you even going to kiss the bride? Eh? Well, I suppose uh, after the appendectomy. <laughs> Hello. Andre. Oh, darling, where are you? I'm home. Oh, that's fine, dear. Why don't you... What do you mean, home? Of course, darling. But you can't be. I'm home. Well, you're home, and I'm home, too. Where? Here, in the same building. You're 17A, and I'm 22B. I took my own apartment. You, you did what? Well, darling, it's the only scientific solution to our problem. What problem? Well, the problem of maintaining our individual identities. Yours is a playwright, and mine is a doctor. Otherwise, they'd just be lost in a hodgepodge of old-fashioned marriage. All customers. right, all right. Don't say another word. I'll be right up. Going down? Up. 22. Well, wouldn't you know it? I'm going down, they want to go up. I'm going up, they want to go down. You can't win. 22. <laughs> that part might over room. We'll see about that. Now, Jake. Isn't it wonderful, Andre? It's horrible. But I'm going to live here. All right, then so am I. Oh, but you can't. That would spoil my plan. It's not a plan. It's a plot. Oh, but, Andre... Are you going to live with me in my apartment or not? No. If you'd only let All me... All right. Th Wait, Andre. You haven't given me a chance to explain. Go ahead. Go ahead. Going explain. up. Down. I don't know where you get such ideas. Look, if you want to go up, I'll take you up. It's all the same with me. Not you. Her. Uh. He won't stay in my apartment. Well, maybe she's just old-fashioned. <laughs> Seventeen. Andre, you have to be reasonable. Well, is it unreasonable to expect my wife to live with me? Well, if you ask me... I'm not. Well, there are several reasons why I should live in a separate apartment. <laughs> and they probably all come out of a test tube. Well, if that's the way you feel, I'm going home. Down? Up. <laughs> this could make me neurotic. I knew when we married that I was a doctor and that I was going on with my work. Yes, but I didn't know I would have to make an appointment every time I wanted to see you. Twenty-two. But the routines of our lives are different. They just wouldn't fit. So we'll live apart. Isn't that sensible? Oh, it's ridiculous. We can have breakfast and dinner together. Fine. We'll be just as married as other people, but we'll have our own lives. Twenty-two. You can write and carry on your rehearsals, and I won't interfere. But I want you to interfere. Oh, I want to be a perfect wife to you, Andre, but I want my own life, too. 22. There's no room for sticky notions of one roof over our heads and jealousy and all those other things that make marriage difficult. Ha, jealousy. My dear doctor, you wouldn't even know how to be jealous. 22. Well, of course not, dear. Jealousy is a very simple matter physiologically. It's merely a secretion of the adrenal glands. Very well, very well. You live on the 22nd floor and I live on 17. I'm sure we'll be very happy. You and me. And the elevator boy. <laughs> You are listening to the Screen Directors Playhouse production of Appointment for Love, starring Charles Boyer with Gail Storm, and introduced by the director of the film, William Sider. You are in Madison, Wisconsin, city of beautiful homes. That rusty lawnmower seems to weigh a ton. You, hot and tired from trimming your grass, pause to catch your breath. The screen door opens. You! It's your wife. And in her hands is a tray containing, <laughs> you guessed it, Pabst Blue Ribbon. Finest beer served anywhere. Yes, during these hot August days, you're just one of millions of men all over America to whom that Pabst Blue Ribbon bottle means welcome relief. For Pabst Blue Ribbon does something more than quench your thirst. It gives you taste. Blue Ribbon taste. The kind of taste you can't get anywhere else in the world except in that Pabst Blue Ribbon bottle. And, fortunately, 
you can get that blue ribbon bottle all over the world. Yes, you hear it everywhere, in Madison and Manchester and Mobile and Memphis. Pabst Blue Ribbon, finest beer served anywhere. Your taste will tell you why. Now, back to the Screen Directors Playhouse production of Appointment for Love, starring Charles Boyer with Gail Storm. George, I've come to you as a friend. I need your advice. Well, what is it? Oh, I've married a monster. You mean Jane? Yes. She lives on the 22nd floor. I live on the 17th floor. I won't go up, and she won't come down. Well, you want my advice? Yes. Shoot her. But I love her. Uh-huh. Well, then shoot yourself. I can't. I'm too brilliant. But what do you want me to do? With five floors between you, you don't need a friend. You need a helicopter. <laughs> You know, it is this silly idea she has about marriage. You know, two people have to be two people. Well, that's nice if you like gin rummy. <laughs> she wants her own apartment so she can carry on her work. Oh, I get it. You live your life and I live my... Oh, that's a sense to break out. How? Go ahead and live your own. <laughs> She'll be so jealous you'll set up light housekeeping in your hip pocket. She doesn't even believe in jealousy. She says it's just uh, glands. So it's glands. But get them working on your side. <laughs> Maybe you're right. Sure am right. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about, Andre. I've been divorced three times. <laughs> Andre, I'm surprised at you, a happily married man, inviting me to his apartment. <laughs> well, why not? You know, so, somehow uh, I can't get you out of my mind, Nancy. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to see you again. Alone, of course. Don't explain, Pappy. Just make with the arms. With, with, yeah, yes, well, uh, with just a minute. Say, I, are you expecting somebody? Hmm? No, no, of course not. Why the should way I you just... keep looking at the door. Where's the lady doctor? In the balcony? No. <laughs> she just, she's at the hospital. You know, Nancy, it was very nice of you to come. Why? You asked me and I wanted to. <laughs> It's been a long time since I've kissed you, Pepper. No, 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 Nessie, wait a minute. Oh. No, 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 no. Hello, Andre. Oh, I'm sorry you're rehearsing. Well, yes. <laughs> you know Miss Benson, dear? Of course. How do you do? How do you do? <laughs> well, I guess I'll be running along. Oh, please don't go. Just keep on with what you're doing. Huh? I'd like to stay and watch you, but I've got to hurry. I have a gentleman waiting in my apartment. Uh, what? Oh, it's all right, dear. I just dropped in to say hello anyway. Bye. I thought I'd been around, but this beats me. You didn't marry her on a bed or something, did you? A man in her apartment? Must be a cozy arrangement. Well, you know, I, I better go and explain this to her. Oh, sure. Poor kid's all broken up about it. Well, she's probably <laughs> tormented with jealousy. Oh, she did say a man, didn't she? That's what the lady said. Yeah. That settles it. I'm going up. Up where? Just up. Yes, Andre. Oh, Jane, I must tell you something. You know, uh, we were not uh, really rehearsing downstairs. No, Miss Miss Benson was paying me a, well, shall we say, social call. Shh, not so loud. You'll disturb him. Huh? Him? Who is him? What is he doing here? A patient, an old friend of mine. Oh. I'm watching his fever. Well, why don't you move his fever into the hospital? Well, because I expect it to break any time, Andre. Well, aren't you even going to let me in? Oh, not now, dear. I'd prefer it if we were alone. I don't like his being here. Well, why not? I have no objection to Miss Benson being in your apartment. I know you haven't. That's the trouble with you. Andre. Why can't you be like other wives? Why can't you be jealous and nag me a little bit? Because jealousy is a primitive emotion, and I am a scientist. <laughs> George. Come on in, Andre. Uh, sit down. Oh, sit down, sit down. How can I sit down? My marriage is finished before it even started. Didn't it work? What? The jealousy trick? Oh, yes, it worked fine. 
It made me jealous of her. <laughs> what happened? Well, I created a scene, a beautiful kissing scene with Nancy Benson. My wife thought we were rehearsing a play. Uh huh. She's so involved in her work, she doesn't even have time to be jealous. Well, look, Andre, suppose you had a character in a play in your position. What would you do? Oh, well, that's a different thing. Oh, I mean, what's not... different about it? A good plot mm. is still a good plot. The wife is a doctor. She devotes more time to her patients than to her husband. Mm. She refuses to become jealous. What does the husband do? Third act? Third act. Well, well, I imagine he, he would become a patient himself. Fake an illness, some kind of accident. Now, she's a doctor. She has a doctor's duty and a woman's instincts. Now, the wife wants to take care of the husband herself. But the other woman gets there first. She lavishes her attention on him. The wife walks in. Jealousy triumphs. Curtain in each other's arms. That's it, Andre. I'll do it. I'll, uh, I'll pretend I broke my leg. Uh, well, a sprained ankle should be sufficient. Good. Now go home and start suffering. I'll get in touch with Nancy Benson and Jim. Ha-ha, <laughs> curtain going up. Darling, I came just as soon as I heard. Oh, thank you, Nancy. Oh, it's it's nothing really, just a, a sprained ankle. Are you in much pain? Oh, I, I think I can bear it now that you are here. But but what about your wife? She's a doctor, isn't she? I'm alone, dear. Alone and suffering. A broken man. Darling, George Hastings just phoned. He said, oh, it's you, Miss Benson. Well, it's about time you got here. Yes, Nancy came to see me, darling. Isn't that nice of her? Charming. And now, Miss Benson, if I may examine my husband. It's my ankle. I think it's sprained. Let's see. Ooh, ooh. Oh, don't be a baby. Miss Benson won't think you're a great, big, strong man. Ouch! Stop torturing him! Hmm. That's strange. Andre, we'd better take your temperature. Hmm? For a sprained ankle? Might have gone to your head, dear. Now open your mouth. Oh. And don't bite the thermometer. Leave it there and don't try to talk. Oh. Now, Miss Benson, would you mind telling me what you're doing in my husband's apartment? Discussing a play. Mm, yeah, well, there's no, only yeah. one play being made around here, and you're making it for him. Mm, mm, mm. Will you take that thermometer out of his mouth? He's choking. Let him choke. Mm. <laughs> oh, let's see it. Well, this is a little more like it. Like what? Like a wife. Here. Here, turn your face to the light. Mm-hmm. What has my face got to do with my ankle? There's nothing wrong with your ankle. Well, what's wrong with my face? Spots. Spots? You've got the measles. <laughs> measles? Well, I think I'll just run along. Oh, just a minute, Miss Benson. Would you mind stepping over here into the light? Now, wait a minute, Florence Nightingale. <laughs> well, dearie, you've got them. Spots? Measles. Beautiful measles. Oh, no! As a doctor, I'm afraid I'm going to have to see that you're quarantined. You won't be able to leave the building. Darling, you mean she and I, we, we, we will have to stay here together? Well, Kathy. Oh, no. Doctor or no doctor, that's not going to happen. Darling? Yes, yes darling. No, no, I'm speaking to the doctor. <laughs> darling, what is the saying? You know, physician... Heal thyself? Well, yes, that's... <coughs> physician, heal thyself? <laughs> Spots, darling. You're getting them. She'd be just mean enough to get measles at a time like this. <laughs> measles. Oh, that's wonderful, Andre. I can't continue my medical duties in this condition. You can't even leave the building. Measles. We'll share them together. We'll make it a honeymoon. Really? <laughs> darling, darling. What, what about, what about... Uh, oh, her. Hmm. My measles are just as good as yours. Any day. <laughs> now, look, Jane. Jane, it's so simple. We'll use your apartment, 22B. Well, what about me? You're, you're so crazy about Andre's apartment. You can stay here. Alone? What'll I do? Count your spots. <laughs> Come on, darling. Going up? Going up. Oh, boy, wait till I tell my psychiatrist. <laughs> We're moving into 22B. Isn't that lovely? Oh, uh, I was laying 8 to 5, you'd move into 17A. We're going to spend our honeymoon there. Andre, I forgot. The measles. What about them? The elevator boy. Oh. <laughs> well, here's where you get off. Happy honeymoon. <laughs> Happy, Happy measles. <laughs> Do 
You have just heard the last act of Appointment for Love. In a moment, our stars, Charles Boyer and Gail Storm, and our screen director, William Sider, will return to the microphone. I happened to pick up a movie fan magazine the other day that was dated 1926. And you can't imagine what changes have taken place since those old days, especially in the home lives of the movie stars. Instead of the elaborate parties and gay nightlife, most of the stars today lead normal lives just like you and me. Their idea of a good time consists of a few friends sitting around in the backyard, a plate of sandwiches, and some cold bottles of Pabst Blue Ribbon beer. Yes, everything in perfect taste. Blue Ribbon taste. And it's that Blue Ribbon taste that makes this internationally famous beer so popular here in Hollywood. I'm going to ask the star of our radio program to bear me out in that statement. Mr. Charles Boyer. <laughs> Mr. Boyer, is it true that Pabst Blue Ribbon is Hollywood's favorite beer? Well, I don't think I'm in a position to know. Well, are you ever served Pabst Blue Ribbon in the homes of movie stars? Oh, quite often. And, of course, my wife and I also enjoy it in our home. Charles. Yes, Gail? You know, you and I have a performer's view of appointment for love. I wonder how director Bill Sider looks at the story. Well, Bill? Well, as I see it, appointment for love is more than just a comedy. It has a very deep and delicate social significance, a sort of moral. Oh, of course. The moral is never trust a woman. Certainly not. The moral is never trust a man. You're both wrong. Well, what is it? Never give an elevator boy the measles. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as we are drawing morals, Bill, there is one lesson we actors and actresses have learned from all our pictures. There is no such thing as a good performance without the guidance of a fine director, such as yourself. And that's a lesson we'll never forget, Bill. Thank you, Gail and Charles, from all the directors. Good night, Bill. Gail, good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. And good night to you, Charles Boyer, Gail Storm, and William Sider. A quick reminder before we say good night. Tomorrow is the beginning of the weekend, two delightful days of relaxation. If you are planning picnics or backyard cookouts, be sure you have plenty of Pabst Blue Ribbon beer cooling in the refrigerator. It's a pleasant way to spend the weekend with friends and neighbors and Pabst Blue Ribbon. Finest beer served anywhere. Your taste will tell you why. Next week on Screen Directors Playhouse, Pabst Blue Ribbon presents Apartment for Peggy, and our star will be Jean Crane. Appointment for Love was presented through the courtesy of Universal International Pictures, now releasing Sword in the Desert, starring Dana Andrews, Marta Torrin, and Stephen McNally. Gail Storm will soon be seen with Dennis O'Keefe and Jeff Chandler in Abandoned, a Universal International picture. William Sider's latest production is Borderline, starring Fred McMurray and Claire Trevor. Included in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Jerry Hausner, Howard McNear, Griff Barnett, and Don Stanley. Appointment for Love was adapted for radio by Richard Allen Simmons, and original music was composed and conducted by Henry Russell. Screen Director's Playhouse was produced by Howard Wiley, with dramatic direction by Bill Carn. Listen again next week when Pabst Blue Ribbon presents... Screen Director's Playhouse, production, apartment for Peggy, director, George Seaton, star, Gene Crane. Screen Director's Playhouse is brought to you by the Pabst Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Newark, New Jersey, and Peoria, Illinois. And sent your way with the best wishes of the Pabst Blue Ribbon dealers from coast to coast. James Wallington speaking. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.